Hey, happy Friday, everybody. Welcome, my name is Mark Maderos. I am the Senior Manager of Community Engagement at Peninsula Open Space Trust, and we are happy to host you all for our event, Bay Area Raptor Rundown, where we're gonna learn all about the falcons and hawks of the Bay Area, or at least the most common ones. So um, I think we could all use a welcome distraction during this interesting week. Um, and so first I'd like to acknowledge the native people whose territories we are on today. I'm in the South Bay and for that reason, I like to acknowledge the Muwekma Ohlone tribe and the Amamutsun tribal band um, whose territories are, are down here. Um, wherever you are, please acknowledge the people whose um, land you are on, the native people. Remember that beyond acknowledging them, um, we should all think about ways to support them in their current day goals. Um, I have a little thing in the camera here. Odd. Um, yeah, so um, for those of you new to post, um, we're going to tell you a little bit about, about our work right now. So um, we're going to load up this cool animation that we've created to show you the extent of our work in the area. We work in San Mateo County, Santa Clara County, and Northern Santa Cruz County. And over the past 40 years, we've protected over 80,000 acres of land, much of which is now open to the public as part of Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space District, Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority, our county parks, our state parks, a lot of these wonderful places that we all love and that we all visit frequently. And today we are gonna be talking about raptors um, and ways to learn about uh, falcons and hawks. And I wanted to mention a couple of the places that POST has been involved in protecting that are particularly amazing for raptor viewing include Wavecrest open space um, over there in Half Moon Bay, as well as Calero County Park um, down in South San Jose towards Morgan Hill. Lots of other places you could see raptors as well, but those are two of, of our favorites. So um, lots of great work over the past 40 years. Thanks to our wonderful community of supporters and donors. We hope many of you are watching today and thank you for joining us. So um, with that, I wanna introduce again, um, our instructor today, bird language expert, Jeff Kaplan. Um, he's the director of the Common Language Nature Program, and he inspires youth science educators in Yosemite, tour guides in the Galapagos, and university students in the Amazon jungles of Ecuador through his education. He weaves mindfulness, citizen science, and bird language to help people from diverse backgrounds feel curious and connected to nature. You can visit his website, commonlanguagenature.com to learn more about his work. And with that, I'm gonna welcome Jeff to the program. Hey, Jeff. Hey, hey, hi everybody. Thanks for joining us on this Friday. Yeah, it's been a little while, Jeff. How are you been? How have you been? Doing really well. You know, it's just amazing to watch all the raptors, many of whom are migrating down the coast our direction. And so uh, I'm going to be talking about them and hopefully you'll get to see them. I'm sure there's some flying through your area right now. That's awesome. Yeah. So um, it's been a little while since I've learned from you and I was just reflecting on how I have to go and rewatch these programs, mm. even after participating like this. Um, I have to go back and rewatch the programs because I didn't absorb everything. So I actually have paper and pen to be an active listener taking notes today. Um, so really excited. I, I particularly love Raptors. I know a lot of our audience members are excited about this one too, because they're just so charismatic and, and cool looking. Um, yep. So, and, mm -hmm. and I will definitely be involving some memory tricks, some mnemonics to help people remember the common Raptors and what we can learn about them and just, lots of different ways to uh, remember because, you know, I've been a long time elementary school teacher and helping people remember is one of the key brain based learning skills that I have. So we'll be having some some fun and some good memories. Great. And I know you're going to mention a couple of those places I mentioned, Calero and Wavecrest and talk about them. Yep. 
Um, and as usual, everybody will try to reserve some time for questions at the end of the program. We know there's some great ones already coming in, so I'll try to make note of those. Feel free to share questions or comments along the way. Engage with your fellow bird enthusiasts in chat. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Jeff. Sounds great. Okay, well, welcome everybody to the Bay Area Raptor Rundown. Rum, rum. You know, uh, it's really interesting because a lot of the raptors are really running down the Bay Area and heading south. So we're going to have a good time. We're going to learn about a lot of them. And um, just going to really, I think uh, you'll walk away or fly away with some good memories and good memory tricks. Uh, first of all, I do want to say that this is the sixth online event that we've done with Post. So if you enjoy this and you want to go back and learn and review, we've got all these other different locations that we've done uh, the birds of, learning by sound and sight. And so I just invite you to head over to Post's Facebook page or look at their YouTube channel and you can learn a lot about a lot of birds in our area. And I definitely want to say thank you so much for the volunteers who are on the land. And I know we're working on getting, you know, all the agencies who you volunteered with making it COVID safe, but I just want to thank you for your work in the past. Um, I am definitely going to keep this presentation playful and interesting because many of our partners work with kids here at San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory, working with kids because we all know, hey, we need to include and inspire more generations of uh, young people to become birders and bird supporters. And so, yeah, I'll be using some different tricks to help people remember about the different kinds of raptors today. I also want to give a shout out to SFBBO for an amazing class that they sponsored by Alvaro Jaramillo, who just knows everything about the local uh, raptors and leads people on international tours. Great class, Alvaro. Thank you so much. And you guys, if you want more detailed uh, descriptions and analysis of all the raptors, I'm going to go into the main ones, but check out Alvaro's tours or check out Alvaro's adventures because he just does great work. Thank you, Alvaro. My name is Jeff Kaplan, and I'm the director of the Common Language Program, and my goal is to help people be more connecting, respecting, and protecting of the birds. And uh, today I'll be teaching about all the raptors that we see in our area. And uh, excuse me, uh, um, my name is Perry, and I am a peregrine falcon. I happen to be an expert here. Yes, Perry, you are an expert. Thanks for joining us. Uh, but first, I'm very hungry. Uh, has anybody seen a dove flying around? <laughs> okay, Perry, well, you can talk about that, and we'll, we'll get lunch after the show. Okay, thanks. Talk to you later. All right, so moving right along, um, I have to say that um, I am grateful to everybody who's here, to all of you. Thank you so much, because I know we are all together in caring for the birds. And, you know, if we can care for all the birds, we'll be caring for the whole environment. This is a small pygmy owl that was rescued by a friend of mine in Ecuador, and we fed it water and food, and eventually it was able to survive and fly away and make its way back to its home. So I just want to thank everybody throughout the world who's doing work to support and protect and care for the birds. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, we are going to start with discovering of many of the diurnal raptors. What does diurnal mean? It means the daytime raptors. Um, not the nocturnal raptors, which are the owls. That could be another workshop in the future, but today we're going to focus on the diurnal or daytime raptors. You know, we're going to focus on how do we identify those guys, especially the common ones. Uh, not many of them wear this name tag. Of course, the California condors now all have a number tag on them, so that's one way to know it's a condor. Uh, but can we learn them by sight and by sounds? I'll be giving you some tips to do that. And if you want to learn more about birds and their sounds, I teach a class coming up starting November 18th, and that's on backyard bird language. So yes, the birds all speak their own language, but they can learn, uh, but they understand and uh, respond to a common language, you know, about fighting and territory and flirting. And so if you want to learn that about your backyard birds, check out uh, that program. Um, then I'm going to take you over to two of my favorite migration stations because, yes, many of the hawks were vacationing up north. They uh, were raising their families in Alaska and places where there was lots of food, and now they're heading south. And so as they're migrating through, it's a great time to see and witness, get excited, and just understand a little bit more about their life journeys because they're heading south for the winter. 
So I'll take you to two migration stations and tell you how to get more information there. And then the last thing I'll talk about is how can we help raptors in these times? Because yes, fire affects them, migration affects them, all different kinds of things affect them. So um, I'll be sharing some things and I hope you will also share in the chat things that you've done to support some of the raptors. And then if we have time, we'll answer your questions. And if you want a complete list of more than 27 Bay Area raptors, I put that together for you. So you can just head over to commonlanguagenature.com and click and download that. Okay, and thank you, Katie, for putting all those links uh, in the, uh, the chat so people can download the lists and go to the classes and just enjoy what you want to. Okay, now, first thing I need to say is I have to admit, to me, raptors are the big stars of the bird world. Now I know what you're saying. No, no, Jeff, hummingbirds are the big stars. Well, no, hummingbirds are the little stars. Raptors are the big stars. But yeah, there's just something about raptors that really catches my attention and makes me focus on them. And so I'm gonna be talking about raptors as if they were kind of movie stars. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like big cultural stars. Now, why am I doing that? Well, I always share a little bit about myself and my family. Uh, I come from a family of people who worked in the film industry. You know, uh, we moved to Los Angeles long ago where I was born and uh, we weren't actors, we were customers. So my great grandfather worked with W.C. Fields and getting his costume. My grandfather worked with Elvis Presley getting his costume. My dad worked with Lily Tomlin getting his costume. Maybe that's why I'm always wearing interesting star studded costumes, I don't know. But today I'm gonna to be talking about a group of actors who's famous, who reminds me of the Raptors. But these are not Raptors, these are the Rat Pack. For those of you who never heard of the Rat Pack, we've got Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., Frank Sinatra, and Lauren Bacall. Yes, you're not thinking, Lauren Bacall, wasn't she in the 1950s? Yes, but the Rat Pack met, met at her house. She was kind of like the golden eagle of the Rat Pack. You see what I'm saying? Who was the bald eagle? Humphrey Bogart, her husband. Yes, the Rat Pack met at their house. Okay, you didn't know that, but now you do. So the point is these guys inspire me and make me think of the Raptors. Why? Well, for one reason, they were the actors and singers who were at the top of the food chain. There were three very good looking, powerful and aggressive, kind of like Raptors. And then there was always a number four sidekick. In fact, here's a shot from Ocean's Eleven, the original, okay, that was done by the Rat Pack. So you might wanna go see them uh, see some of these uh, movies that have been remade, The Rat Pack. But today, we're not going to talk so much about The Rat Pack. We're going to talk about The Rapt Pack, because these are the most powerful, aggressive, and top of the food chain birds. Okay, got that one? Here we go. Now, first of all, I'm going to say that uh, we're going to go to some of the raptors that I and other people have filmed on location. In other words, go to post-supported post parks and preserves. And I will be referring to different movies to help you remember throughout this entire presentation. See if you can count how many movies I refer to to help you remember the wrapped pack. Here we go. First of all, we're going to the post -preserve, supported preserves of Bear Creek, which I did a presentation on earlier, and Sierra Azul. And for those of you who don't speak Spanish yet, Sierra Azul, what does that mean? Blue Mountains. That's right, and the sky is blue, the land is blue, and so of course, as a customer, I had to wear my blue face mask, you know, just to be fashionably organized. Now, both of these are within about, um, you know, 35 minute drive from each other, uh, 15 miles as the Subaru drives, or probably a lot less than that as the Raptor flies. But um, they're down in Southern San Jose, uh, close to Los Gatos, and if you want to go hiking in either of these to see the raptors that are flying through, I would encourage you to go to one of our colleagues' websites, Mid Peninsula Open Space District, because there you can download great maps that show you all the trails, show you which ones are dog friendly, you know, with a leash and just how far they are. And you can plan out some walks to get to some high points. So just great resources and I encourage you to check that out. So. The wrapped pack today flies into four rolls, just kind of like the rat pack. And I'm gonna give you an example of different raptors from each of these different groups so you can remember them. And I'll give you some first over here in Sierra Azul, and then I will spread out and we'll go into second examples in other locations. So here we go, the first four big stars. 
The first group, the first family, are called the Buteos. So I'm going to nickname them the Beautiful Buteos. Everybody say that with me. One, two, three. Beautiful Buteos. Okay, now say it three times fast. Beautiful Buteos, beautiful Buteos, beautiful Buteos, beautiful Buteos. Great. All right, now you got that in your head. Now, what does it mean to be a Buteo? Well, the Buteos are the group of hawks that you can identify by their behavior and their physiology. For one thing, they have big wings. Uh, and this, of course, is going to help them soar around. Then again, they've got big tails. Their tails are wider and shorter than some of the other raptors we're going to talk about today. Um, yeah, you might be able to figure out who this one is from that beautiful tail. And of course, the last thing they do is make big circles. All right, big wings, big tails, big circles. Now, I know what you're saying. You're saying, Jeff, who is it? Come on, just tell me. And by the way, why do I say who? Why? Because to me, the birds are people too. It's just the way I look at them. They're not a what, they're not an it, they're a who. Okay, so I'll give you a hint. This is a red-tailed hawk. Now you're looking at it and you're saying, oh, Jeff, I don't see the red tail. Well, there's a lot of diversity among hawks. Let's face it, the red-tailed hawk in particular, they have all different color variations, different morphs. They have different ages, so the juveniles will not have a red tail. Well, think about us. When we were teenagers, did we dress like mature adults? No, I don't think so. Well, same with the red-tailed hawks. So how am I going to identify a red-tailed hawk through various stages of its life and different color morphs when it doesn't have a red tail or the light just isn't right? Well, I'm going to give you a trick that I use, and that is I don't see a red tail, but I see black biceps. Okay, everybody grab your biceps right now and just you know, squeeze that part of your muscle. Okay, yeah. If you had black biceps, I guess it would be a tattoo at that point. If everybody in your family had black biceps. We would be able to identify you as related to these red-tailed hawks. What am I talking about? Well, if you look at the bone structure of the hawks and the humans, we have some similar bones and there's a particular area on the wing of the hawk called the patagial area. And it stretches there from the shoulder out across and um, it's black on the red-tailed hawks. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of where our biceps would be. So who is this? It's the black biceps hawk. Who is this? It's the black biceps hawk. Oh, and now you can finally see the red tail. Who is this? I don't know, I can't see it. Okay, let's get out our binoculars. Okay, can you see the black biceps? All right, again, so just a way to look and see it. Now, I have to say that um, in California, as we say, and, you know, many other places, so everyone is innocent. Anyone who's accused of a crime is innocent until proven guilty. And we birders say that any hawk that is observed is a red-tailed hawk until proven otherwise. So, you know, now you have a little bit more information to identify. Oh, yeah. That's a red-tailed hawk. Okay, just in summary, beautiful Buteos. You see them, they've got big wings, big tails, big circles. And uh, one of my interesting things to watch when I watch the Buteos and other raptors is, are they circling clockwise or counterclockwise? I'm gonna encourage you to check that out next time you watch some beautiful Buteos. Okay, we're moving on to the next family, next to the wrapped pack. And these are the acceler accelerating excipitors. Everybody say that one time. Accelerating excipitors. Okay, now three times fast. Accelerating excipitors, accelerating, ex okay, I can't even do that. Now, this is a nickname I gave them. The family name is excipitors, but why am I calling them accelerating excipitors? Well, it's because of their behavior. First of all, they eat fast food. What? Yeah, birds in particular. They don't eat uh, slow animals, they eat fast food. In order to catch these birds, like this starling that's being eaten by this particular exhibitor, in order to catch this food, they have to dry, fly fast and furious. I mean, they will fly up to 60 miles an hour, they'll make sharp turns, they will stop on a dime to catch this bird that's been hiding in the trees, and most raptors can't do that. But the accelerating excipitors can do that because of one special feature that they have. What's that? They carry a third wing. What? Let me explain. Here's a video that's going to show Ellie the English excipitor. 
I want you to watch and see if you can identify what I'm talking about as the third wing. We're going to test Ellie to the absolute limit. This is how it's going to go. She is going to be on the other side of this wall, and I'm going to be here with the lure, which means that to get it, she's got to fly through that hole. We're going to shrink the size of the hole. We're going to change its shape, and I've got another dastardly trick up my sleeve. First, in real time. Now, slow down. And now by 40 times. Slow motion reveals how, with her wings closed, her large tail acts as a third wing creating the lift that she needs. Let's make the hole smaller. If you look at her eyes, you can see her protective nictating membranes closing. They're semi-transparent eyelids that keep out the thorns. Now, I'm going to rotate the slit to simulate the small gaps between trees. Ellie seems able to mould her body to any shape. Next, I want to simulate a tunnel through the undergrowth. Amazing. Ellie turns the situation to her advantage, using her legs to launch herself at her prey. Okay. So, as you can see, that tail is used as a third wing so that the bird can fly through all kinds of challenging situations in order to catch up. And of course, who are we talking about? This was in California, an example of the Cooper's Hawk. Cooper's Hawk is a very interesting bird that you will find is coming more and more into our neighborhoods. So how do you how do you identify, the Cooper's Hawk is a great example of an accelerating exhibitor. How do you identify the Cooper's Hawk? Well, for one thing, it kind of looks like it's wearing a Cooper's cap. You know, not one of those rounded baseball caps, but kind of flat, dark black on the head, darkish gray, and definitely a uh, flatter head than some of the other beautios, uh, the accelerating exhibitors. Second thing about it is, some people think that because Cooper's hawks eat birds, that they should be put behind bars. Well, you know, if you look at the tail of this juvenile, I see some bars there, and I definitely see a lot of bars here. I guess that person wasn't talking about putting them behind this kind of bars, but they definitely are behind bars anyway. So when you're looking for Cooper's hawk, look for that barred pattern, even on the adults here. And then the last thing that helps me identify Cooper's hawk is the long tail. The tail is just longer than a red-tailed hawk tail. So um, yes, definitely. The, I'll have to say one other thing that helps me identify them is the fact that I see them in my neighborhood more and more. And if you're somebody who lives in the city or you're somebody who lives in a neighborhood or wherever you are, after today, you might start noticing hawks flying through your neighborhood and good chance that those are a Cooper's hawk or a sharp shinned hawk, the other exhibitor. So um, these two are very common, and until somebody brought this up, I didn't realize that, yep, I see them swooping through, they're coming by the bird feeder, all kinds of things like that. So take a look for those three things, those four things, in fact, Cooper's cap, behind bars, long tail, and they are in many places now your neighbor. Now, some people call Cooper's hawk the urban eagle because they are so common in the city. 
Well, they're definitely not an eagle. But uh, here is one that is in somebody's uh, fountain, and um, they're just taking a bath. And uh, it's interesting that they have adapted, these are hawks that have adapted to sharing life and habitat with humans. Uh, John Young, who writes the book about bird language, What the Robin Knows, I was hanging out with him the other day and he told me a story. He said, you know what, Jeff? The Cooper's hawk is very practiced at wake hunting. I said, what? What is wake hunting? He says, well, it'll follow the garbage truck up my street and wait for the garbage truck to scare birds off their trees from the sound, and then that's when it'll find them. I said, wow. He said, yeah, it has done that so often that nowadays it doesn't work, but the birds all alarm when the garbage truck is coming up my street. They're saying, hey, there might be a hawk behind. Wake hunting. I've actually seen Cooper's hawks hunting behind a coyote. The coyote's running across the field, and the hawk's flying behind to see what the Cooper's hawk kicks up. So that's hunting in the wake of either a garbage truck or a coyote. The last thing I'll say about Cooper's hawk, and this goes back to the research about them, their favorite food appears to be a fusion food, Eurasian collared dove. And in fact, I saw feathers just the other day in my backyard, and it was since it was a Cooper's hawk, I looked, and yep, sure enough, those were Eurasian collared dove feathers. That's the big dove that seems to be the most aggressive around my bird feeder, and I guess it's also one of the most tasty. So keep an eye out for Cooper's hawk and their favorite food. Okay, again, accelerating excipiters, what do we know about them? They eat fast food, they fly like the Fast and Furious, and they carry that third wing. Okay, let's move on. They're fast, but you know who's faster? The falcons. So let's talk about the faster falcons, and then we'll get an example of who that is. So for example, what makes the faster, the faster falcons a group? Well, their high speed means that they are able to get their food very quickly. And I just saw uh, one of these falcons hunting the other day. And it was just amazing. It let its prey get far away and then caught up in a minute. You know, the second thing is that you will also see the falcons have very pointy wings. This helps with their flight dynamics and enables them to pick up speed quickly and move fast over long distances. And then the other thing is, they're seen worldwide. The falcons that I'm going to talk about are seen in so many different countries, up and down our coast and in other places in the world. Maybe they just got a lot of mileage points from flying so fast, and that's why they're able to travel everywhere, but you'll see them everywhere. So first one I'm going to talk about is the peregrine falcon, and peregrine falcons are interesting and are identifiable, but excuse me, uh, are you talking about me? Yeah, I am. Okay, well, let me take over here. All right, so uh, <clears throat> as he was saying, we tend to uh, fly around pretty fast. So we wear this black helmet of feathers. You see that? Okay, yeah, yeah, it's right there on top, yeah. And we also wear what birders call a mustache. That is a certain color of feathers coming down from the side of our nose. Now, my mustache is very wide, as you can see. Uh, other falcons, they don't quite carry as wide a mustache as me, but uh, I definitely do. Uh, pale throat. Yeah, I see that, Perry. Uh, and uh, barred belly. Uh -huh. Yeah. I, so. Okay. Well, thank you, Perry. Uh, I think we'll keep an eye out for you uh, because uh, you definitely are one of the most powerful and fastest falcons around. Um, you know, and uh, I have to say that uh, if you look at the falcons, here's the adult on the left and the juvenile on the right. They look very similar, like mother, like son. Why do I say like mother, like son? Because uh, I grew up with two moms, and so uh, that's the way I grew up, and that's the way I am, like mother, like son. So here's peregrine generations, and uh, yeah, I think you'll be able to figure out when you're seeing a peregrine. Um, now, interesting falcon facts, peregrines have been revered by uh, royalty for thousands of years. This actually is a uh, trained falcon cap, so uh, falconers uh, who train falcons We'll put a cap on them to help them feel relaxed and safe and not fly away. This one is studded with diamonds. Yeah, those are real diamonds. Uh, throughout the Middle East, falconing, and then uh, the kings in England and all over the world. So pretty amazing. Uh, my friend Kenny is a falconer, and he said, Jeff, hey, you want to take a photo with this falcon? And I'm like, you can see how close I am. I'm terrified. I'm like, is this falcon going to eat my eyes? He said, keep your glasses on. But uh, Kenny is the founder of Full Circle Falconry, and he does really amazing live falcon demonstrations with 
uh, owls and falcons and hawks. And so I encourage you when we become feeling safe to be around, uh, get out there and see one of his shows, Full Circle Falconry. And uh, I'm thank you, Kenny. And I'm glad this falcon didn't uh, munch on me. <laughs> Uh, now, as you probably know, falcons, peregrine falcons, are the fastest animal alive. Yes, they can get up to speeds more than 180 miles an hour. Now, how do we figure this out? Well, it turns out that in 1997, a parachuter, uh, Kay Franklin, said he jumped out of a plane and, and tracked a falcon. But, I mean, there weren't the electronics that is the falcon that he was a falconer with that he raised. There weren't the, the electronics then to track that falcon. I mean, how did they do it? So I'm not really sure I believe this story. But then I found a video. So is this really true? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, Katie, why don't you let me load this video for a second? All right. And... Okay. A pair of skydivers can exceed 150 miles an hour in free fall. So Lady was going to have to fly faster than that to catch us up. I'm ready. I'm ready. Andy, okay. I'm ready. This is Five Steve seconds. Leonard, who's not a parachuter, jumping out to measure the speed of a falcon. All right. I couldn't believe it. Right. Lloyd won't let us jump until he's absolutely sure Lady is ready to fly. Lady is in charge. We just had to wait. Right. White, come on, lady. White, 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 white. That white yellow thing lure. is the lure white. that the, pal the white. falcon's going to follow. It white. looks like a bird. Camera, ready, steady, go, go. This is just amazing. Bloody hell. In moments, we were clocking 158 miles per hour. Scary. And Lady, within seconds, she'd caught up. She was just playing around us, effortlessly, in complete control. Okay, well, there you go. That Falcon flew, was tracked at 180, but it had to go faster than that to catch up with them. So just amazing. And uh, interesting thing, as we observe, when the Falcon's going at 150, it's got its wings in a triangular shape, what we call a dihedral. And then it slurs down to even just a straight line when it's doing that above 180 miles an hour. It's just amazing. And then, they have actually, with current technology, been market uh, measured at up to 240 miles an hour. So just amazing. <sighs> so inspiring to see these peregrine falcons. Now, you may not know it, or you may, but peregrine falcons have a miracle associated with them because they were on the brink of extinct. It turns out that uh, back in the 1950s and 1960s, we were using a lot of poisons. I've uh, done some reading about this. We were trying to get rid of all the mosquitoes on the planet. Guess what? Those poisons, and in particular DDT, got into the falcons' bodies. Now, how did they get into the falcons' bodies? Well, sure, the poisons were on plants. A mouse ate the plant. The peregrine ate the mouse. And after eating a whole bunch of mice, eventually it affected the falcons. They didn't die. But when the mother falcons were producing eggs... Have you ever tried to crack an egg and you couldn't crack it because it was too thick? Imagine if it was too thin. The peregrine's moms would sit on top of their own eggs, and because of the DDT that had been in their body, the egg shells were so thin that they would crack their own eggs. They would crack their own eggs by sitting on them just with their normal weight. And so falcons were dying even before they were born. So there was a group called the Peregrine Fund, and the Peregrine Fund has been rescuing raptors for 50 years now. It's their anniversary. 
and you can see him holding up a picture of a baby peregrine. And uh, so they are just amazing. And uh, right now, Peregrine Fund works on rescuing all kinds of raptors throughout the world, not just peregrines. But they had success in picking up the eggs from the nests, raising them safely in, uh, you know, the Peregrine Foundation buildings and site, and then returning them back and helping them fly. So this is an example. It's taken us 50 years, but this is an example of a bird of an amazing raptor that was on the brink of ex being extinct, and we were able to rescue it. So I just made a donation to the Peregrine Fund uh, in honor of this work, and they're doing so much great work all over the world. And I think we got the link there in the chat. Okay, so just in review, faster falcons, high speed, the highest speed, pointy wings. And, you know, I see the same raptors here in California. I see them in Ecuador. I see them all over the world when I travel. So pretty amazing. Okay, now the sidekick. Remember I said there was a sidekick in the rat pack? Well, in the wrapped pack, there is too. So what am I going to choose for my sidekick to go into detail? I could talk about the turkey vulture. Uh, you know, that's uh, one of the raptors, mostly eats carrion, uh, but Sibley includes it as a raptor. And, um, you know, when I see them, I often see their wings are like this. They're kind of in a triangle shape and they're tipping back and forth. Uh, geometry students call this a dihedral. I call it a triangle. Uh, but in any case, um, I just call them tippy vultures because they're often flying and tipping back and forth. And so I can tell, oh, yeah, even though I can't see any marks on it, that's a tippy vulture. See, I could talk about the golden eagle. Uh, yeah, uh, reminds me of Lauren Bacall. Um, you know, you see how the wings on the golden eagle are really out flat there? They're not in a dihedral, they're out flat. Uh, certainly a bigger bird. Or I could talk about the osprey. Okay, my intuition says let's talk about the osprey. Okay, so here we go on ospreys. And now ospreys, first of all, how do you identify them? Well, just a lot of really beautiful black and white feathers throughout their body. You can see that black and white. It just really stands out when they're flying. Usually they'll be flying over by water, you know, over by Lexington uh, or other lakes or places where they can go fishing. Uh, second thing about them is unlike the peregrines, which have mustache, these guys do not have mustache. They have eyeliner. You know that big eyeliner that some cultures use, you know, to really celebrate the eyes yeah well that is um that's what they got big eyeliner third bent wings when you see a the golden eagle fly you saw how its wings were out straight and same with the turkey vulture well ospreys will often fly with bent wings now do you get the idea it's kind of like a v up in the sky as they're flying by now why do they do that i'm not really sure uh alvaro said you know when they dive they're in the water and the bent wings help them kind of oar about and uh, get out of the water after they've caught their prey. So thanks, Alvaro, for that interesting story. Um, you know, if you look at them, they dive with their feet first. So I think of pelicans as diving for fish, but ospreys, look at that. Just amazing. Wings back, feet first. You know they're going to go down into the water. You know they're going to need to be able to get out of the water. And uh, this is on the National Parks uh, alternate uh, Facebook site. And uh, when those feet go, feet go in, not only do they have their claws, but they're actually barbs, like fish hooks have barbs on their feet. So when they get out of the water, they can hang on to that fish that's flopping about. They will often do this trick where they will throw the fish up in the air and then catch it to make it face forward. Why do they want the fish to face forward the same direction it would be swimming? aerodynamics? I guess so. It's kind of like a missile or some kind of thing it's carrying, just wants to be able to fly fast back to its nest. And speaking of nests, ospreys nest all around. When I was in southern uh, Baja, California, they actually have nest boxes on top of all the street lights. And in the downtown on the main street, there's many, many ospreys just nesting right there where you can see them. Now, this particular one is a, an osprey nest outside of a baseball field in the parking lot. Huh. Now, you're probably thinking, oh, my God, we got to clean that nest off there because uh, the lights won't be able to be in use. No, actually, there's a platform that this baseball field put up so that the ospreys have a good place to build their nest. So uh, they build on street lights. Uh, if you go over to the eastern side of the Sierras, Mono Lake, you'll see the ospreys have built their nests on top of the Tufa Towers. Now, it's interesting because the 
water in Mono Lake is so salty, there's no fish in it. Why do they build their, their nest there? I think it's for the beautiful view because you see the ospreys then flying up to, uh, you know, different creeks and different lakes and different reservoirs all on the eastern side of the Sierras, getting fish and then flying them back to feed their babies on top of the Tufa Towers. Yep, osprey nests are an amazing thing to see. Okay, well, that's all now for ospreys, but I just want you to take a minute and look at this beautiful bird. Osprey. Okay, well, now we are going to move over to the post coast. We're going to head on over to uh, just near Half Moon Bay, and this is a piece of land that was protected by post. It's called Wavecrest Preserve. And, uh, you know, because the color of the crest of the wave is that light blue, I had to fashion-wise wear this light blue mask. Uh, it's actually very close to Half Moon Bay. I was just going through Half Moon Bay uh, last Friday. And, uh, yeah, it's just easy walk, uh, about two miles. And uh, if you're getting out along coast side, you might enjoy heading out on some of the trails at Wavecrest. Okay, so now we've talked about beautiful beautios before, but now I'm going to go into a second example of a beautiful beautio, and this one is the red-shouldered hawk. Now, obviously, how can you tell it's a red-shouldered hawk? Well, you look at it, the shoulders and the chest are red. Notice it does not have black biceps, red shoulders. Here's an adult. <clears throat> the juvenile does not have the red shoulders yet, um, but it's also got bars on belly and chest, but its tail is not as long as the juvenile occipiter that we talked about, Cooper's hawk. So, yeah, red-shouldered hawk. Um, now, I have to say that when it comes to social media among raptors, the red-shouldered hawk seems to post the most, meaning I hear it screaming more than any other raptor. So, uh, yep, they post on HawkTube all the time. Let's see if you can hear this. And if you've heard this before, after today, you should know that who's screaming is the red-shouldered hawk. Here it goes. Okay, everybody, do that on your own version of Hawk Tube at home. On the count of three, go. Keer, 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 keer. One, two, three. Keer, 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 keer. One more time. Keer, 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 keer. Okay, that is the red shouldered hawk. And you'll hear it doing that. I, I talk about this hawk in my bird language class. You hear it doing it when it's protecting territory or when crows are attacking it. And somebody asked about that earlier. Yep, crows will attack. You know, a group of crows will attack a hawk if it's getting close to what they perceive as their feeding area. Sometimes the hawk will ignore it, sometimes it'll scream, and sometimes it'll flip over in midair and grab one of the crows. So, pretty amazing. All interesting stuff about the red-shouldered hawk, who's the most frequent to post on HawkTube. Okay. Now, in addition, Here's some more fun facts about the red-shouldered hawk. In addition to being very vocal, on hot days, they prefer cold dinner. What am I talking about? Well, you know, the red-tailed hawk prefers to eat warm-blooded rats and mice. But on hotter days, research shows that the red-shouldered hawks will eat lizards, snakes, and crawdads, cold-blooded creatures. I don't know. You know, I'll be honest, sometimes I like a cold salad on a hot day too. Well, this could be, uh, we're related in our food preferences. And then the last thing I'll say about uh, red-shouldered hawks, I mean, they are a beautiful beautio and they definitely can soar, but oftentimes we'll see them perching kind of secretively in a tree and staring down looking for something to eat. Now this brings up an interesting question for me because you know, when I am getting food, I go out shopping or I might be a gardener and I'm raising food, but these guys are just sitting in a tree. I'm curious if they're eating these snakes 
and they prefer to perch. My question is, are they getting bored? I mean, let's face it, they're staring for hours and hours and hours and hours. How do they survive that? Well, this is a very interesting question. And so I have a theory of my own. And the theory is, if they're sitting there staring for hours and hours and hours, I'm going to have to say that I think they're mindfully staring. I think they're in some state of meditative looking for their food. I don't think they're agitated or going crazy. I think they are calm. I think they are in rapture. And that's another reason that I call them the wrapped pack. Okay. Well, I, goofy, I agree. But think about it next time you see a hawk just sitting there staring. What do you think's going on for it? Okay. All right, now back to our beautiful beautios. Let's compare the two and see if we can identify which is which. Which is the red shouldered hawk? Put the letter in the chat, A or B? Okay, red shouldered, black biceps, yep. And my friend Chitty, uh, from Nigeria pointed out she doesn't need a tattoo to have black biceps. She's got black biceps. Yes, I agree. And they, they are very beautiful. But my point is, we got to remember, black biceps on a hawk is very good indication that it is red tail. Okay. Obviously, we can tell which one, A. And now, which one's the red shoulder? B. Now, I'd like to play their two sounds because they sound very different. And I'd like you to be able to identify the two hawks by their sounds. This is the red tail. Got it. Now, what's the red shoulders going to sound like? Okay, got the difference? Great. So next time you hear it, you may not see it, but you'll be have a good chance of identifying whose hawk is hunting around you. All right, so now we're going to head over to San Gregorio Blue House Farm Preserve. And, you know, it turns out farms are very important habitats for raptors. Um, I also want to give thanks to uh, Andrea for taking this photo, and I took part of this photo. And my favorite traveling tool uh, when I have to take photos is Photoshop. <laughs> yeah, you probably figured that out by now. So this is Blue House Farm, so I had to put on my blue mask. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, there's a great blog post by Laura O'Leary, and uh, it talks about how farms, you know, which some people might not think of as natural environments, are actually very important habitats. They're, first of all, they're a sustainable local food, which is what I like to buy for people right? Because they're growing food locally and I can pick it up. They're sustainable local food for raptors because the raptors are hunting for the mice and the lizards and all those different kinds of things. And then finally, I just want to acknowledge that Post has gone beyond just helping the birds. Post has actually supported this land that's helped farm workers. Yes, farm workers need a place to live too. And so Post has helped revitalize this piece of land and this farm in a way that made safe and comfortable housing for the farm workers who are there. So thank you very much, Post, appreciating the diversity of all the support you're giving the many different living creatures, raptors and humans. And if you want to read more about Blue House Farm and how it was rejuvenated and made into a habitat for humans and raptors for the foreseeable future, head on over to the link that's in the chat. Okay, so I'm gonna pick another sidekick right now. I, I could do another accelerating accipiter which would be sharp shinned hawk, but they look very similar to um, the Cooper's hawk. So I think I'm gonna just go off on a sidekick. Now, here's the sidekick I'm gonna pick. And I have to say, this raptor is amazing and really points out that raptors are adapters because it is an unusual hunter. This is the Northern Harrier. Basically, it's an owl's head glued onto a hawk's body. <laughs> what am I talking about? Well. Here's an owl. This is a barred owl. And um, not in our area, but they have been seen in San Mateo County. And uh, the ways that owls hunt are with their super sensitive eyes, but also their super sensitive ears. Now, why are their ears sensitive? Because they have this special process 
and feature, which is called a feather disc. The feather disc are the round shape of feathers around their eye. So that round disc, you see that round disc around the eye? It's not just for looks, it actually focuses sound into their ears. So when it's very dark, they can actually hear their prey running around in the dark, even if they can't see it. And it's that round disc of feathers. Well, guess what? The Northern Harrier has that same round disc of feathers. Do you see that, the circle? And do you see how it's different from the black biceps? I'm oh, sorry, red-tailed hawk? Red-tailed hawk's got the longer head. The Northern Harrier has got that round disc of feathers that's gonna enable it to hear even better. It's kind of like that cool parabolic listening binocular that I wanna get that would enable me to listen and see the birds at the same time. Well, Northern Harrier's got it. Now, another ID tip about Northern Harrier is that when you see it from the top, they have a white belt on. Now, that's kind of unusual to see a raptor from the top. How could you do that? Well, it turns out that like other white belted beings, this Harrier has got some special tricks. Now, who am I talking about? A white belted being? Well, the Karate Kid, of course. Yeah. So. White belt reminds me of special moves and tricks. And like this uh, karate student, the Northern Harrier has got those same tricks. What it does is it can hunt by sight, but also by sound. So if it's early in the morning when other raptors can't see because it's too dark or late at night, the Harrier is still out hunting because it can hear its prey going around in the bushes. The other interesting thing about the Northern Harrier is it doesn't fly high, it flies low. So whereas the hawks are flying up, most of them very high and have to stoop down to catch their prey, the Harrier is flying down very low, so close to its prey, it's, you know, it's almost harassing it. Uh, by the way, what does the name Harrier mean? It means harasser. To harry is to harass. And that's exactly what the harrier is doing. It is so close to its prey that it's basically unexpectedly showing up, surprising it, and eating it. And it's just amazing. If you watch the northern harrier catching food, it's definitely harassing its prey. So what else is in a name? Well, this is the male northern harrier. And the male is gray. You saw the female and the juvenile, which were brown. The male is gray, and it's called the nickname gray ghost. Why? Well, I guess it's just got gray hair like me, you know, good looking, white belt. Uh, but the point is that uh, there are many fewer males in the Harrier population than there are females. So if you see a gray ghost, you'll know that that is a Northern Harrier and it's a male. Okay, so that's our summary of the sidekick. Raptors are adapters, a Northern Harrier. Okay, I'm gonna go into another faster falcon. And uh, this is the American kestrel, seen throughout North America, Central America, South America. You can see it's definitely got the mustache and sideburns, well-dressed. Here's the male. And they have pointy wings as well. And here's the female. Now, how can you tell the difference between the male and the female? You know, you could carry your book, your bird book along with you, uh, and that would help. Or you could just buy this t-shirt from the Peregrine Fund. And that way, you'll always know. I mean, it's just an easy way to remember the difference. Uh, fun facts about the American kestrel. It weighs as much as 34 copper pennies. That is light. Think about it, 34 cents. That's how much an American kestrel weighs. Second thing is it's got ultraviolet vision. Yep, behind those eyes is the ability to see ultraviolet light. Now, what would that help? Well, this superpower helps because rodents often leave trails of urine on the ground as they're walking along, and those reflect ultraviolet light. And so sure enough, when a kestrel is looking at the ground, it's not just seeing a bunch of green, it's seeing ultraviolet reflected, and so that's the road to find its prey. The last thing is it really needs Airbnb. What am I talking about? Well, you saw the ospreys building their own nests, Kestrels don't build their own nests. They need to rent a nest on Airbnb. Specifically, they need to nest inside of a hole that was created by a woodpecker and that was left behind. So 
That's the behind part. That's the, the B of the behind, Airbnb. So we're going to talk about what we can do to help kestrels because it's hard for them, especially in these days when many trees have burned down, it's hard to, for them to find a nest site, a hole in a tree where they can raise their young. Now, in comparison between the faster falcon family, what do you notice that's similar between these two falcons? Yep, some people pointed out, okay, I see the mustache, I see the curved head, I see some of the spots. What do you notice that's different? Kestrel, much smaller. You know, if the peregrine falcon is the mighty Mustang of the falcons, then the kestrel is kind of like the mini Cooper. No, oh, that's confusing. That would be like a Cooper's hawk. Okay, we'll say it's the mini Miata. But the point is they're both fast and they both, you know, handle like race car drivers as well but the Kestrel is much, much smaller. Okay, time for us to talk about our sidekick. And here's the sidekick we're gonna be talking about. Now, birds of prey know they're cool, but I have to say that kites know they are the coolest. And this cartoon I made is an homage to Gary Larson who did a uh, cartoon in the 80s about, oh yeah, raptors know they're cool. So nowadays, the, I think the kites know they are the coolest. Whitetail kites, how do you identify them? Well, again, white body with many black accessories, many black feathers on them. Second thing is that they have fancy moves. You will often see them in a field, and this happens in Calero a lot where I see them. Uh, and they are kiting or hovering while they're hunting for food. And so they're just a you know, little breeze. They stay up there, and they're just amazing moves. Now, they have even more fancy moves than just that. And imagine... If you've got fancy moves when you're working, what do you think their moves are used for in other times? When they're flirting or fighting. Yeah, exactly. So here they are. I'm not sure if these two are fighting or flirting, but this is a dance that kites will do when they are uh, uh, mating, mating dance. So now, uh, you know, that's interesting. Uh, I just don't quite get why they use these kind of really aggressive moves when they're, uh, you know, trying to find a mate. Um, it's, uh, well, eh, I guess, you know, think about it. If you mix all these shades of white and black, what do you get? Shades of gray. So maybe that explains why they use all these moves, you know? Uh, it's just, uh, okay, don't think about shades of gray anymore, but you get the idea. Another thing they do when they're mating is that the males will bring an engagement ring to the female and the female will turn upside down to accept it. Uh, it doesn't have a diamond on it. It's actually got a rat on it. It's a rat ring. Yeah, the male will bring a rat and she'll accept it and then they'll fly off. And that's one way that they communicate, okay, I'm picking you. Yes, I accept your proposal with the rat ring. Interesting thing, we have a toy here uh, in English speaking countries called the kite and it was named after the behavior of this particular bird. Now, of course, this toy came from Asian cultures much earlier than it was here, but in English, we call it a kite named after the kite. And then the last thing I'll say about the kite is that up to a hundred of them will roost together. They're very familiar in community until it gets to be breeding time. And that's when they will say, hey, stay away from me. I don't wanna to talk to you. So looking at this particular bird, is it gonna be roosting with other ones right now or no? See that stick in its mouth? That's because it's building a nest. So this is not a time that you will see these birds roosting together. Okay, we're gonna talk now about hawk migrations for a few minutes. And yes, we are gonna run past one o'clock, probably about 15 minutes. So uh, if you need to go, you can always pick up the rest of this show online at the post Facebook page or on the YouTube channel uh, because hawk migration is going on and it's really amazing. So if you need to migrate to your work or something else, feel free to come back later on. Uh, I'm gonna talk about two sites in particular. First one is Hawk Hill. That's in the Marin Headlands. And as you probably guessed, it's right across the bay from the Golden Gate Bridge. Yep, you go, in fact, you drive across the Golden Gate Bridge and uh, you can head up there to see the hawk coming across. Now, what hawks are coming across? Well, 
eBird is one of my favorite tools for noticing what other people saw yesterday, the day before, the month before, etc. So you can go on eBird and it, it takes a while to find your way to the exact Hawk Hill location. So I just made this shortcut. So if you uh, type in, if you copy and paste, we'll have this in the uh, chat, Katie, uh, number six. Um, if you just uh, cut and paste this into your uh, browser, tinyurl.com, Hawk Hill Migration 2020, it'll take you to the latest sightings that people have posted on eBird and you'll be able to see when they saw these hawks and how many and all kinds of things like that. eBird is just a great tool for doing your homework if you're going to go out to some place and seeing what was seen yesterday or the last time somebody was there. Now, turns out, usually I will drive up to the top of Hawk Hill, but with the uh, new traffic restrictions, I parked at the bottom and I hiked up a mile and a half to see the hawks. So this was great. I needed the exercise anyway. If you have a dog on a leash, you can hike up there and just, it's a great time. And you know, Hawk Hill is the way up, the hike up is a fantastic time to see gorgeous views and to see a lot of other birds that are there as well. The second way you can find out what's happening and who's coming across Hawk Hill on a minute by minute basis right now during the migration is go to Golden Gate Raptor Observatory. And uh, GGRO is a group of volunteers who are out there and they are counting every single hawk, every single raptor and bantail pigeons and all kinds of birds that are migrating across that hill right now. And when you think about it, why are birds migrating across that hill? Well, they've been coming down the coast and they've been flying you know, along the land and then they get to the San Francisco Bay and there's this huge gap of water. And for some of them, they haven't come across that big a gap of water before. So the cool thing about Golden Gate Raptor Observatory is they will list, put online, exactly every bird they've seen as they see them. And so if you go to this link, parksconservatory.org, programs, daily hawk count, it'll show you the hawk count for today and other birds as well. You can see it's got uh, merlins, uh, turkey vultures, cooper's hawk, all kinds of wonderful birds flying through. So that's a neat thing to watch. And uh, as we're hiking up, we're looking on our phone and seeing, okay, what birds, what raptors just came across the top? Because we're not at the top. And now we can see them down lower as they shoot across the top quickly. Well, it turns out what happens is they then spend a lot of time lower where we were on the trail. Now, why would raptors be circling over and over again over this land instead of just shooting right across? My theory is for some of these raptors, they were born up in Alaska and Canada and Northern United States, and this is their first migration. And this is the first piece of giant water that they've gotten to, and they're not really sure what to do. So I counted a pair of raptors, uh, I think white-throated swifts, not quite sure, but there definitely were some that had just come across the hill, circling 15 times over and over and over again on the land that we were on and then finally disappearing into the mist and crossing over the Golden Gate Bridge. Just amazing. Think about it. First migration of their life. And some of them take their time, get their courage and velocity up, and then start flapping across. And you can see them going there in the distance. So I encourage you to take a break if you can in the next couple of weeks to drive on up to Hawk Hill. And uh, you can either park at the bottom and hike or you can drive all the way up and see who's coming down. Okay, speaking of coming down, they are headed down the coast and many of them will arrive at Wave Crest Preserve in Half Moon Bay. Pretty amazing. And uh, here's the link that we'll put in the chat for you to see what hawks have been seen recently by people posted on eBird at Wave Crest. There's no uh, Raptor Observatory, so it's citizen science. It's you and me posting out what we've seen so people have an idea of what is being seen there. Now, I have to say, raptor migration, some of the raptors just stay in Half Moon Bay because it's a great place to stay and they can get the food they can they want. Uh, and so you will see, what is this one? It's got two discs around its eyes. It's flying through the day. Yep, flying low, Northern Harrier. Now, some of these hawks are going all the way down south to Panama. Remember, everything is a red-tailed hawk until proven otherwise. No, these are 
actually broadwing hawks. And this photograph was taken in Panama recently. These are what we call a kettle of hawks, a whole bunch of hawks. And they're actually heading down to Argentina. Some of these hawks are going a long way. Now, I have to say, sometimes I just can't figure out the raptors by sight. You know, and it's okay for me. I used to feel bad about it. You know, I was like, ah, I'm not a good enough birder. I can't figure out the name. And so I try to get beyond that and just feel good about connecting with the birds. Because there's, if I just name the bird and walk away, you know, put it on my list and walk away, I don't feel like I'm really giving it the respect and having the connection that I want. So I say the mystery helps us listen, learn, and connect. You know, not knowing the name of the bird is okay. I even have some birds in my backyard that I just continue listening to. I haven't named them yet because once I name them, oftentimes I just go, oh, whatever. But if they're a mystery, I keep listening and I keep watching. So at this point in our class, normally I would be teaching ID bird ID by sounds and bird language. But as you can see, this class has been running pretty long. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you a way that you can ID birds by play. And it's with an app called LarkWire. And so I got this app, I put it on my phone, and LarkWire will allow you to play a game so you can listen to all different kinds of birds, birds that sound similar, and then figure out and learn which are which. So I put together a list of the birds. You can choose which birds you want to work with, or you can work with all of them. I put together a list for this Raptor Rundown 2020. And it looks, the game looks like this. It'll show four different birds, and then it'll play a sound, and you will click on which one you think it is. So let's see. What do you think? Okay. Anybody got an idea what that is? I can play it one more time. Put it in the chat if you want. What is that bird? Okay, so I clicked that that was, I clicked that that was a kestrel. And sure enough, I got a green bar next to it saying, yes, Jeff, you got it right. So then I played a couple more. I got the osprey wrong. I got the red-tailed hawk right one time. So let's keep playing and uh, listen to this one. See if you can tell what this one is. Okay, anybody got a guess? All right, so I clicked red-tailed hawk and that was correct. Now, interesting thing about this game, you can either look at the pictures or you can look at the descriptions of what the sounds are. And so red shoulders hawk, they say kier, uh, red-tailed hawk, uh, kia. And so, you know, it's not a perfect description, but when you click down here, you can either go by the, click it back and forth between the pictures or the written. Okay, let's listen to one more. What's this one? Okay. Now, if you've taken my bird language class or any of my other classes, you know that this is a trick imposter. This is a Stellar's J imitating a red-tailed hawk to scare everybody away from the bird feeder. Yeah. All right. Well, we go into that in bird language class, but you get the idea. Not everything is as easy, so don't worry if you can't get it perfectly by sound. But I love this game. I play it when I wake up in the morning because my mind is somehow open to learning foreign languages just as I'm waking up. And so I'll be there in bed listening to different birds, and I get a better score early in the morning when I'm just waking up. Okay, so again, that game is called LarkWire. It does have a fee, but, um, you know, I think it's a really good learning tool for everybody. Okay, we're going to talk briefly about what we can do to help the hawks. And I have to say, you know, this is a comparison between the rat pack and a pack of rats. Because nowadays, fall is coming and rats are coming in to, um, coming in to people's lives and uh, we want to get rid of them. You know, we do not want to deal with um, deal with them. And uh, I'll have to say that in the past, I would be putting out rat poison to kill them. Well, it turns out that it turns out that rat poison is also raptor poison. Why? Because the mouse eats the poison and then it walks outside and the raptor eats the mouse. And sure enough, eventually the raptors are poisoned. So we need to do our best not to poison the raptors by poisoning the rats. And, you know, now there's a legal industry 
uh, of marijuana. And I just have to say, I saw this poster. It made me laugh, but it's an important point. Uh, you know, are the rap, are people who are growing this, now it's legal, you got to use legal poisons or legal ways to protect your crop. Just don't be poisoning your marijuana. I mean, think about it, this poor hawk, the mouse was eating the marijuana, how's the hawk going to feel? All right, you get the idea. So how do you kick the poison habit? Switch from poison to peanut butter. This is a trap I put in my house, put in my garage, the rats come, they love peanut butter, and I'm able to catch them and put them to, uh, you know, to a grave without there being any poison involved. Second thing you can do is offer shelter. This is a kestrel condo. Now, when you provide a kestrel condo, you have to have a hot tub and a, you know different rooms. No, I'm joking. Uh, but it's true that kestrels need support too because they can't just build their own nest. So there's actually a program called the American Kestrel Partnership. And if you go to that website, uh, it's part of the Peregrine Fund. If you go there, they'll teach you how to build or buy a kestrel house and then you can post it up and keep track of when kestrels come and people are doing this and helping the kestrels and we're learning how the kestrels are taking advantage of the housing that we're providing. Another kind of housing that we're providing as members of POST is habitat for rare birds. And so there's a great blog by Matt Dolkus that talks about how Coyote Creek was protected and it was the first recorded birth of a Swenson's hawk in Santa Clara County. And just an amazing uh, blog I encourage you to read about bird behavior on post land. And this was just made me feel really happy. Okay, and then of course the last thing you can do to offer support, and I don't mean feed the raptors from your hand, okay? That's not what you're supposed to do, but you might want to use your hands to make a donation to some of these agencies that are rescuing raptors. Uh, in Santa Clara Valley uh, Wildlife Center of Silicon Valley is great. In Santa Cruz area, native animal rescue is great. We've also got at UC Santa Cruz, the Santa Cruz Predatory Bird Research Group. And I donated to them and they're just a great place that's been doing research for many years. They also train volunteers to help protect the raptors by doing studies on them. So good stuff. All things we can do to respect the raptors. So in today's workshop, we talked about diurnal raptors, the daytime ones. We learned some ID and some uh, by sight and by sound. We went to visit two migration stations and talked about some different ways that we can help raptors in these times. If you want to learn more about bird language that you can use in your backyard, in the big city, in the Amazon jungle, or anywhere else you travel, I encourage you to check out my class. It's going to come up starting on the 18th for four Wednesday evenings, and we'll be talking about the birds and the raptors in your backyard. And that's at commonlanguagenature.com. And if you want the complete list of all the raptors, including the ones we did not cover today, definitely go over the common language and download the list. Okay, well, thank you so much for enjoying the Bay Area Raptor Rundown. And uh, I know we're towards the ending time, but Mark, what do you think? Should we answer some yeah. questions? What can we do? That was incredible, Jeff. Thank uh, you. Loved that. Um, and I learned a lot. And let's take some questions because there were some good ones. Um, uh, so I, I took some, I took I kept track of, of some of the questions that came in. Um, one I just wanted to mention um, was we mentioned a few places that you could go see raptors. Um, again, Wavecrest Open Space near Half Moon Bay, um, Calero County Park. Um, these uh, places, there's information on our website, um, openspacetrust.org slash hikes. Um, you can figure out some more information there. And you mentioned um, a couple of other spots, was it, Jeff? Sure. Well, you know, many of the raptors are migrating right now, so they could be coming through any of the open spaces in your area. Uh, I will say if you have the time and energy to go to Hawk Hill, that's pretty amazing. And, uh, you know, there's live counts of what raptors are coming across. And then if you hike up, you'll see them doing that big circle decision making process. <laughs> and it's just an amazing thing. So, yeah. Great. So um, some places to note and, and to get out to. Um, so there was a great question by Carrie about crows. And I have this question, too. Mm. You know, I see crows or other small birds following hawks so frequently. Yep. Um, and can you just talk a little bit about what's going on there? Sure. Well, you know, it's really interesting. 
Um, it's called mobbing. Mobbing is the technical term. And so you'll see a bunch of uh, brewers, blackbirds, a bunch of crows, all different kinds of birds, smaller birds, mobbing a bigger bird. And then why are they doing that? Well, because they're afraid that that bird is going to be eating their young, robbing their nest, uh, just in their territory. And you see this more during the mating season, but I just saw it yesterday, you know, we're, we're past the mating season. Uh, so uh, yeah, just protecting their territory. Now you think, isn't that crazy? Isn't that smaller bird gonna get eaten by that bigger bird? Well, it turns out the smaller birds are more agile. They can do things, you know, like kids running around through a store and you can't catch them. Well, <laughs> that's what the smaller birds can do. They can fly around and the bigger birds often can't catch them. So, uh, you know, you start noticing now if you ever see a raptor sitting on a fence or on a wire and then there's a smaller bird next to it who's not afraid of it because the smaller bird knows it can get away. And so that's the same kind of thing that smaller birds do in packs uh, to, uh, you know, attack the raptors to clear them out of the area. And it happens to crows. Anytime smaller bird, bigger bird, I watch the crows come in and then all the, the smaller blackbirds would attack them. I actually watched a crow surfing on top of a hawk the other day. Wow. Like it would actually land on the hawk. I, I'm sure it was trying to intimidate it and get it to go out of the way, but that's kind of dangerous surfing. You know, I've heard of hawks just flipping over and grabbing that crow. So that's funny. You got to watch it. Northern California. Yeah. Like surfer or skater. Exactly. Crow. Surfer, skater, heaven. <laughs> yeah. Um, you mentioned the Northern Harriers um, nesting on the ground. Um, actually, I didn't say they nest on the ground. Okay. I said they fly on the ground. Yeah, okay. they fly very close to the ground. Okay. Yeah, Christine was asking um, whether they're nesting on the ground or if there's any other raptors that nest on the ground. Actually, I could think of um, the burrowing owl that's yep, not definitely. nesting on the ground, living in burrows. Yeah, and I would say to, to answer that question, I don't know the answer because I keep a lot of information online. You know, my brain just doesn't store all of it. But um, Birds of the World is a great website, and uh, you can pay for a year you know, for $60 and then get information on the nesting behavior, everything about all the birds in the world. Uh, for free, you can go to all about birds, but I like the the bigger one because it just, it'll answer that question, you know, where do the Harrier, Northern Harriers uh, nest? And it's just pretty amazing. So more resources to check out. Wonderful, Jeff. Well, thank you for the time. Great job as usual. Um, everybody loved your presentation and we hope to have you back soon. Uh, for everybody who watched, thank you for joining us. Again, Jeff's website is commonlanguagenature.com. You can go there to get more resources um, about the uh, birds and the places that Jeff mentioned today. Um, and I also want to mention that we hope you could join us next week. Um, you could go check out openspacetrust.org slash events for a lot of really great upcoming events that we're hosting. Next week, we're going to be focusing on the Bay Area Ridge Trail. Um, we are going to host this with the Bay Area Ridge Trail organization um, and talk about the past, present, and future of that project, ways that post intersects, and some of the updates from around the Bay Area. So that's going to be a, a great one also. So we hope you can join for that. And with that, I hope you enjoy the weekend. Hope some of you can get outside and see raptors and um, relax a little bit. So you too, Jeff. Thank you so much. All Great right. to see you again. Bye, everybody. See you all.